Good people of South Baltimore, thank you for tuning in to this episode of South Baltimore Now, the podcast brought to you by SouthBmore.com. I'm Nate Carper, and welcome to today's episode. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Mark Riccobono, the president of the National Federation of the Blind. Our conversation actually takes place right here in South Baltimore at the amazing NFB headquarters situated on Wells Street, right at the corner of Riverside Park. Now, if you're a regular traveler on I-95, chances are you've glimpsed this very expansive building countless times. But have you ever wondered what happens within these walls? Today, we're diving deep into the heart of the National Federation of the Blind, exploring its mission, impact, and the incredible work being done to empower individuals with low vision and blindness throughout the country and right here in Baltimore. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome President Mark Riccobono. President Riccobono, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Nate. It's a, it's a, a pleasure. I feel like I've arrived uh, at a destination, being a <laughs> fan of uh, the podcast, the website, that's how I get my news as someone that lives in the neighborhood. So it's a real honor. Oh, thank you so much. That's great to hear. It's great to hear another subscriber, another <laughs> liker of SouthBmore.com. Kevin will certainly appreciate that. <laughs> I am here today flying solo. Kevin has the day off. Hopefully we don't go too far off the rails. But <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you could share with our listeners, what is the National Federation of the Blind is all about? And talk a little bit about your mission, who you serve. And even if you can get into a little bit of the history of the organization and this iconic headquarters, I would love to know more about that. Okay, recognizing you've asked me a two-hour question, oh. I'll, I'll condense it by <laughs> saying the National Federation of the Blind knows that blindness is not the characteristic that defines you or your future. And every day we raise expectations of blind people because we recognize that low expectations create obstacles between blind people and our dreams. So first and foremost, most importantly, you got our name right. The most important <laughs> word in our name is of. And there are a lot of organizations for the blind, agencies for the blind in this nation. But the most important word in our name is of. We are a membership organization of blind people. We were not founded in Baltimore, but right up the street, actually, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, mm. in, on November 16, 1940, to form the National Federation of the Blind. And since that moment, we have been a nationwide membership organization driven by blind people. Our members, the majority of our members have to be blind. And our national board all have to be blind people who are members who can get elected at our national convention, which happens every year. So we really have a grassroots uh, nationwide organization of blind people working to raise expectations for themselves, working to change the understanding of blindness in society, working to create opportunities for blind people. But the thing that it's important to know is that it's a membership organization. We do have non-blind people who join a uh, number of uh, folks in, in Baltimore who have come to find our mission to be important have joined as members, but our governing documents say that the majority of members have to be blind people. And I would say way over 90% of our members are, are blind. So nationwide membership organization doing advocacy work, civil rights organization, how do you land in South Baltimore? Well, our headquarters kind of followed where our president was until 1978. And our president at the time was Kenneth Jernigan. I like to describe him as the Martin Luther King for blind people. He really led a very aggressive period of civil rights for blind people. He really set the tone for the, the blind, determining what expectations should happen in society and what opportunities we should have, and really shattering a lot of the misconceptions about blindness, which I'm sure we'll talk about. We started looking for a national headquarters, and this property where we are today, actually the building at 1800 Johnson Street, was for rent. It was an abandoned, mostly abandoned warehouse building. It had an umbrella factory in it at one time. During World War II, there were fish nets and sails made in this building. A number of things have happened on the property, you know, old warehouse building. He toured it and looked around and said, could we buy this building? And eventually did work out. And on September 1st, 1978, we bought the entire city square block for $532,000. Wow. 
At that time, Wells Street was still a dirt road. And we spent another half million dollars to renovate part of the fourth floor of that original building. And this is no exaggeration. The Federation was completely broke. We had no other money. And so when you talk about the facility we have today and the work that we're doing, the most impressive thing to know is that since that time, 1978, everything we've done at this property has never had a penny of debt financing. It's all been hard-earned money that the blind people have helped raise. The community has assisted us. The building we're in now, which just celebrated its 20th anniversary. We opened it on January 30th, 2004. The building that now faces Well Street had $6 million or something from the state of Maryland. So we've gotten a lot of support, but all really grassroots from blind people around the country. Now that is a very condensed version of 80 <laughs> years. But what I would say is, you know, when we moved here in 1978, Wells Street is a dirt road. I-95 is not right. going by this building <laughs> right, yet. Right. In, in many ways, we were fortunate. We had a property that was close to DC without the DC prices, mm -hmm. but we have found a home in Baltimore from the neighbors to the support that we've had from city council, members of the Maryland delegation, all, all sorts of folks. Maryland is our home. And now blind people all over the world know about Baltimore, Maryland, because they've come to our building. They receive our literature. They, they don't know anything about Wells Street, yeah. except that it's in Baltimore. So that's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I can tell, yes, there's a lot to that history <laughs> that we could talk about for hours, and I appreciate the nod to the neighborhood. Another question that I'm sure, again, could be a completely different episode that could go on for hours, but I would love to know more about your team here, your role here, some of those responsibilities, a little bit about the behind the scenes of what happens within these walls. So this is the national headquarters for our organization. So a lot of the work happens by blind people in local communities coming together in local chapter meetings. This is our national headquarters, so it's our kind of central base of operation. As president, I'm elected by our members, so I work out of this building. I actually was a staff member as I came to Baltimore in uh, late 2003. So I was a staff member and have served now as president for almost 10 years. So I was split 10 and 10. The folks that work in this building are members of the staff of the Federation. So they're paid employees and they really carry out the background infrastructure work of the organization. So a lot of work that we do, obviously, with databases and technology to keep our members connected and communications. We have publications that really go out all over the world that are sharing the authentic stories of blind people that really unique from what you can get anywhere else. We also run services out of this building and our ethic is we're a membership organization, but we're really here for all blind people. So a good example is within this building, we run a service called NFB Newsline. It allows blind people to get access to the text of over 500 uh, daily newspapers, magazines, periodicals, job listings, weather information, and they can do that for free all in an accessible format through this service we've created. And it started as a, a little telephone box here in this building in the 1990s. And now, of course, a lot of it's cloud-based. But the big thing here is that if you're a blind person, access to information is one of the biggest problems you have, right? You can't just pick up a piece of paper and read it instantly like you can if you can see. You can't pick up the, the newspaper and, and read it. And so this service has transformed giving blind people access to information. The other category of things that happen in this building is we do host a lot of events for leaders of our organization, important meetings in disability. An example, two weeks ago, we had almost, we have an affiliate in each of the 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We okay. had about 40 some of our affiliate presidents come here okay. for a meeting. We have lots of meeting space. We can host meetings. We have uh, about 26 sleeping rooms so we can uh, house people in the building. We have a kitchen, we can feed them. So really they come to do leadership development training, but we can do it all right here, which is a huge advantage. But then also more public facing events. Next month, we're having our 16th annual Disability Law Symposium, which brings the disability rights community together right here in South Baltimore to talk about the future of disability law. 
And then we try to be good stewards of the neighborhood. So for a decade or better, have housed the graduation ceremonies for Thomas Johnson. Mm -hmm. In June, we often, people have come into our building because we house forums for mayoral debates or yeah. you know, public safety meetings. We try to do that so that we can also use our space to bring people here to be a part of the community. That's great. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And my next question was actually going to be about as neighbors and residents, and you live here in the neighborhood as well, how can we better support, how can our listeners better support the National Federation of the Blind from a very neighborhood level? Are there specific ways to contribute or whether it be in donations or volunteering or other activities or utilizing the spaces more? I'm just curious, what could the neighborhood do to maybe help support more? So as a nonprofit organization, there's always a need for public support, right? Donations, always appreciated, volunteer efforts. We'd love to know what interests people have, and we'll find a place to, to put your time and talents to work, whether it's with our national effort or maybe potentially with our local chapter or with some of our partners who do work also in this building. We have a partnership with the American Action Fund for Blind Children and Adults that operates out of this building. It distributes more free Braille books to kids all over this country than any other entity in the U.S. Yes, at a basic level, we're a membership organization, nonprofit. We need financial and in-kind support, but also our advocacy initiatives, which you can find at our website, nfb.org staying tuned in on the work that we're doing to make policy changes that create uh, a positive environment for blind people. And then the other thing is upping your own awareness about the things that you can do either in your local business here in South Baltimore or with your employers or that sort of thing to raise accessibility. And then the final thing I'd say is blind people are walking around this community all the time. And a couple of days ago, I stopped into Moo Moo Cow, mm -hmm. happened to be ice cream fan. <laughs> and there was a family there and the one of the children was asking me and the person I was with what was wrong with our eyes. Now, a lot of parents are like, oh, don't ask mm -hmm, that question. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, that's, that's appropriate, right? Because yeah. we don't want them to think that asking about disability is a bad thing. So that was an opportunity for us to educate. But I think yeah. what I want to communicate there is when you see blind people walking around the community, just say hello, yeah. right? Oh, because yeah. so often the first thing is, do you need help? And, you know, I live in the neighborhood. I, mm. I walk 10,000 steps, so yeah. I'm, I'm walking the neighborhood all the time. I appreciate knowing someone there is there, and I appreciate them saying hello. You know, what is really off-putting is when you walk by someone and they're plastered up against the wall mm -hmm. because yeah. they want to give you space, but they don't even say hello to you. Right. right. Engaging with blind people in the community, and we do have a lot of our staff and members who live in the neighborhood. We want to be active in the neighborhood, too. And so engaging us in those activities, asking, hey, is there anything we can do to make things better for your participation. I think that's great. We want to have those conversations. That's very important information for our residents and folks here in the neighborhood. Our, we do have a tight-knit community here in the mm -hmm. neighborhood, I, I believe, and we could always be tighter and we could always make sure we're doing the best we can to be inclusive of everyone. So you, you did touch a bit on accessibility before. How has accessibility improved in this area that you've noticed over the years? And are there still specific areas I'm sure that need attention? Or what wins have you seen recently, maybe in, in certain infrastructure or just uh, public policy or anything that's local? What I would say is, of course, there's been a lot of attention to the, the built environment, which is useful. I know the park has done a lot of work being thoughtful about making sure that surfaces are accessible, especially to individuals in, in wheelchairs, adding curb cuts. Those things matter more for people with other mobility challenges, not right. blind people, but they're useful for all of us, right? But that's my opportunity to say, anybody who walks South Baltimore knows we're not known for our sidewalks. Oh, <laughs> and we are not. There, there's a lot that every citizen can do to make sure that they're doing their part, right? I'd say as blind people, one of our uh, common concerns these days are the scooters, which people tend to yeah. park in the worst places yes. really for all pedestrians. We find them parked on wheelchair ramps and just in, in places that are really not helpful. But the same is true for folks recognizing, you know, if you don't move your trash can when it gets left in the middle of the sidewalk, yeah. it's an annoyance for someone like me that's gonna find it with my cane, but it could actually be 
a complete blocker for someone that needs physical access. There's a lot of things that individual citizens can do, you know, when you have a tree in the summer that's gonna hit everybody in the face yep, uh, when they're yep. walking down the street. Take care of it, right? Because it, it makes a difference. I, I would say the thing that is really great to see is a number of the businesses in South Baltimore, and, and maybe because we're here, they, they often ask, where can they get Braille menus? Are there things they can do? Have a real awareness because there's a lot of us here. I think sharing mm -hmm. some of those practices. And the last thing I would say is that sharing information is always important. And I appreciate when people in the neighborhood, when I'm out walking, will share information that might be posted on a sign somewhere. Hey, did you know someone's looking for this cat or what, whatever? Because yeah. there's incidental things that you're not going to see. And I think right. that's where the neighborhood information network is helpful. Excellent. Thank you. So let's talk tech, if we might, for a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know there's been advances in audio and video technology, online technology. The Nation's Blind podcast recently published an episode on AI technology. I'm just curious how advances in some of these platforms and streaming services have impacted accessibility and like what role does AI, and that's the big talk of everything now, that's the big buzzword and seems like AI is everywhere, but how has that been influencing what you do and making it easier or improvements that are needed or maybe some advances that have already occurred? Yeah, so it's a really great, again, three hour discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Technology has been transformative for everybody. And one of the ways it's been transformative to blind people is it ha has helped us shift our thinking from the, I would say, 1980s, 1990s understanding where we're going to have computers and as blind people, we need to find additional software to add to those computers or hardware to make them accessible to us. The shift in this century in the last 20 years is if you're going to build it, you should build it to be accessible to blind people from the beginning. Just like with a building, right? You don't build a building today and then go elevator. That right. would have been very right. helpful. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, the elevator makes it more functional for everybody. So when we build it from the beginning to be accessible, technology is transformative just like it is for everybody. So I have an iPhone on my desk behind me, the same iPhone that anybody else would buy. I can go to the Apple store, take the iPhone out of the box, triple click the home button and it's talking to me out of the box. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost me a penny more. And that is built in accessibility of the type we like. The issue becomes that a lot of technology is developed without that built in accessibility idea. And so websites where there are very good standards for how to make sure your website is accessible, the standards are not known or get ignored. And so then blind people face barriers in those websites. All of us are doing digital transactions every day. And as a blind person, if you have to do lots of workarounds because the one button you're supposed to hit to submit something online is not properly labeled and just says button, you know, <laughs> you're gonna spend three times as long as someone who's not blind on that transaction. So those things add up in a day. And those are all things that can be solved because there's very good standards out there. So, you know, for anybody that has a website, there's definitely uh, clear guidelines and things you can do in the development process to make them accessible. But technology has allowed us to have better access. So earlier I talked about those printed documents that before we could not, <laughs> we had to go through all sorts of things to get access to. One of the first projects we did in this building 20 years ago was to build a reading machine that a blind person could use that was handheld, that was revolutionary at that time. Today, that technology is basically built into the iPhone, into mobile apps. And so I can take a photo of a printed document and have it read back to me in seconds. Wow. That's transformative because I can do that anywhere. Yeah. When you speak about AI, there is an application called Be My Eyes, and some people who may be listening may already be volunteers. It's a peer-to-peer -peer platform where you can volunteer to basically make a video connection with a blind person who might need help with some visual task. Be My Eyes is now using OpenAI to do image description. So I can take a, a picture of Riverside Park and get a sense of, oh, how, how's the uh, construction going, you know, oh, or what, wow. what's different from yesterday, yeah. which is really quite cool. And during the recent snowstorm, my 
thing has always been, you know, I have to stick my head outside to get a sense of the weather. I took a picture out of my window and uh, it gave me a pretty accurate description of the snow on the cars and the street. Obviously, it's not going to tell me how deep the snow is, but I didn't have to go downstairs and stick my head out to find out <laughs> how much snow is out there. So yeah. really cool uses of technology. And our goal in all of this is to give blind people more control over use and access of that data and those tools. In this building, we're exploring what are the next waves of that? How do we get images to be not just accessible through description, but can we create technologies that can make them tactily accessible? And what opportunities might that open up? Wow, that's an interesting area to explore. Yeah. So you would be able to have that image, touch it, and somehow be able to discern what it is. Yes, yeah. and uh, one of the things that we're working on the partnership with some other organizations is a, consider it a tablet, but so I have in front of me here a, a one-line refreshable Braille display. So this okay. basically displays Braille, but it refreshes. So I, I can connect it to my iPhone and I can page through and look at everything on my iPhone in Braille. But we're working with a group to have a tactile display that could display 10 lines of Braille at once, but then also could do graphics. So blind people could have instant access to graphical information and analyze that information in ways that have never existed. So that's the kind of innovative stuff yeah. we do here, which is really fascinating, really cool, sometimes frustrating. Some of the technology work is we push the technology to, you know, again, equip blind people with more ability to Take the data and understand it in their own way. As the amazing motto goes, live the life you want. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. President Riccobono, I really appreciate you being on today. And my final question for you is simply, you mentioned Moo Moo Cows, but you live here <laughs> in the neighborhood. And I'm curious, what do you enjoy? What do you and your family enjoy doing for fun here in the neighborhood? Places you like to eat or things you like to do for fun? But I'd love to get to know you a little bit more Oh, personally. the pressure. <laughs> I have to say, especially during the pandemic, I've really gotten an appreciation for Riverside Park. Uh, I walk the park almost every day, and uh, it's just a great gathering spot. Obviously, the concerts in the summer, the work that many amazing volunteers do to keep the, the park up and running, a huge asset for this community. A lot of great small businesses, right? And on the peninsula, and as a, a dad with three kids, uh, I don't, don't get to them as much <laughs> as I would love to, but yeah, I mean, it's great that we have so many ice cream options now, all right? Love having Taharka in the market and from Sobo Market, which is right around the corner from, from my house to the Cross Street Market area. And then some of the mainstays in the neighborhood. Fenwick Meats has always been a great place to get fresh stuff. Just a big fan of, of the environment and a lot of appreciation for the business owners uh, on the peninsula who I think really try to be a aware and conscious of their impact on the community. And that's that's the thing I love about the area. That, that was a little bit of my political answer to not call too many people out. There's so many great options, right? That's a really that's hard and, yeah. Yeah, really hard question. Sorry, that, I didn't know that was gonna be the gotcha question. Or anything, but yeah. <laughs> President Riccobono, this has been amazing. I thank you for inviting me into the uh, beautiful facility today and for hosting me here. And it's been awesome getting to know you better and what goes on behind these walls here. And just really thank you so much for being a wonderful organization and a community supporter here in South Baltimore. And thank you all for listening today. Thank you so much.